here. You're about to hear some pretty good advice from a guy who really knows his stuff, so please welcome Tom McFadden. And what we're talking about, I mean, we've been kind of hitting on distributors here for a bit. I mean, not to rub, the guys, not to rub these guys up, you know. I think, it, I think where this is heading in the marketplace world is that there is going to be a blurring or demarcation line for who's offering maybe the same set of best user experiences services to who that core customer is. And those buyers are changing out there. So if they find that a marketplace might serve them just as well as their traditional distribution company, yeah, you might see some interesting mixing and matching down the road here. But for now, you know, Distribution companies are playing a big role in marketplace development, and Tom's going to kind of take us through kind of why that is. So please welcome Tom once again. You know. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I'm Tom McFadden, CEO of McFadden Digital. We've been building marketplaces for 15 years and e-commerce solutions for 25 years. Uh, been fortunate to serve about 10% of the Fortune 500 and hundreds of uh, mid-market clients as well. And uh, today's the last day. If you want to get a copy of this uh, book, our uh, almost 500 page book. It's free on uh, Amazon Kindle uh, during the Vision B2B show. So uh, feel free to grab that there. I can give you a copy of the hard copy as well if you're interested. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, three things around marketplaces. So what disruption is happening to uh, distributors and other uh, industries because of the marketplace model? Why is the marketplace model so disruptive? And who runs a marketplace? Specifically B2B operators of marketplaces, distributors. So First subject here, we're going to look at uh, some of the disruption that happened in the last five years in uh, marketplaces, comparing traditional businesses, dist traditional distribution or e-commerce business models in, in black or the dark color here on the screen, against the red marketplaces. Uh, so we are fortunate here at Envision B2B to have the CEO of Ranger speak to us yesterday and the VP from MSC yesterday. Uh, and for multi-billion dollar companies, you know, this is impressive to still be doing 16% growth or 10% growth over five years. But, you know, in the last five years, or five years of this graph, Amazon grew from 1, 1 billion to 25 billion, or a 2,400% growth. Quite disruptive in the, the B2B distribution channel. If you look at the manufacturing side, so the CPG brands, uh, and this, this graph is a little different, it has the years in business on the horizontal axis, which is about 75 to 200 years of age for these uh, CPG manufacturers, and the employee count, 50,000 to 150,000 employees at some of these CPG brands, and the, the bubble size represents a number of brands. Well, in the last uh, four years, uh, about 100 different uh, e-commerce aggregators came along, uh, like Thrasio, Heyday, and these guys have been buying up brands uh, on the average of one a week for a Thrasio uh, last year. This industry raised $12 billion in, in 2021, or a billion dollars a year going into buying marketplace sellers. So of course the brands that uh, Thrasio owns are not the same as Colgate, Palmolive, Unilever, Coke, or Pepsi, or the other uh, brand manufacturers here, but you know, a billion dollars a month uh, going into an acquisition a week, building up brands for a manufacturer, some disruption is going to happen. Of course, the, the change in the stock market and investment may change this, this trajectory, but it's certainly been pretty disruptive in the past. In the general merchandise, it's more on the retail side, but you know, department stores have been flat or actually de declined a bit in the last five years, uh, versus the general merchandise marketplaces have grown on average 800%. Looking at the Amazon's, Alibaba's, uh, JD, uh, Mercado Libre in, in Latin America, We've done these studies in over a dozen different vertical markets and see very similar you know, disruption, drastic changes from the uh, traditional uh, e-commerce or retail or B2B distributors or manufacturers uh, compared to the, the, the marketplace operators. So lots of other research from many organizations. Digital Commerce 360 does some great research on marketplaces. Uh, this is from a report by Miracle that showed that the marketplaces uh, growth uh, sales doubled uh, that compared to traditional e-commerce in both B2B and B2C. Uh, Pre-COVID, during the peak of COVID, and towards the tail end of COVID, hopefully at the tail end. Uh, and they also generate more traffic. So with a larger catalog size, you have on average 29% more products from a marketplace compared to e-commerce, which drives four times the traffic. So you look at quadrupling, if you could quadruple your traffic to your website, wouldn't that be a great benefit? I'm sure nobody would, would uh, would uh, be unhappy about that. So that's the, the what's happening, what disruption is going on. Let's consider why this disruption is happening. 
So um, Alex mentioned the pipeline business model, uh, a platform. Uh, it's better to, easier to understand what a platform is by comparing it to what it is not. So it's pipeline versus platform. So let's look at traditional B2B distribution as a pipeline, which is essentially a sequence of activities, very labor intensive, have to happen one after the other. Usually the first step is for a distributor is sourcing goods from a manufacturer. You have to find those goods, negotiate those contracts. That might be a one to two month uh, process sometimes. We've seen that some of our clients. Load that data into the ERP. Oftentimes it's a cryptic, you know, 40 character, 80 character product description. Uh, it has to be loaded into the ERP. Then you have to go through the process of merchandising, adding the SEO optimized text, uh, putting in photos, any other uh, content that you may want in your system uh, for describing that product. You set the price, it sounds trivial, but it's actually an important differentiator we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, the distributor or the retailer uh, will, or e-commerce operator will set the price. You hold the inventory both physically and financially, meaning you have to have sufficient distribution center space, fulfillment center space to physically hold all the goods, and you have to outlay the cash to financially hold those, those goods with the capital. Processing the orders, of course, uh, usually this is automated uh, process, but still a step in the process. And then fulfillment, of course, uh, actually shipping out a pick and pack, pallet, or small, small goods, uh, or truckload, to finally get to the customer. So eight steps in this labor-intensive, slow process to get to a, a transaction. So that's the pipeline business. In the, the platform model, you just have two main categories of labor. You have uh, somebody to recruit sellers and somebody to support sellers. And you have a, a standard terms and conditions, so you don't end up having to negotiate contracts with every single vendor. And these can be, you know, you're going to look up a commission rate in a commission grid that may be 10%, 15%, 8%, depending on the category and so forth. You have to ship within uh, 48 hours of receiving an order. You have to respond to customer queries within eight business hours and so forth. All those standard terms that apply to all of the sellers in the network. And you build this ecosystem, which is not really a linear, but it's more of an exponential growth. As you add another node onto this network, it's an exponential or logarithmic growth to the, to the process in terms of the number of connections between sellers and buyers. Of course, the buyers are the customers on the, the right side here, just like before. But you have a whole uh, collection of third-party sellers. And essentially what you're doing is that pipeline of activity, most of those activities are outsourced to the third-party sellers. So they can be sourcing goods from another distributor. They, they source the goods, they negotiate the price, they load into the ERP, they do the merchandising, they uh, set, set, set the price, they do the fulfillment. Uh, all those activities are outsourced to the third-party seller. Of course, some sellers may source from multiple distributors. You may have multiple resellers or third-party sellers sourcing from the same distributor. So there's that price competition in which drives the, the uh, marketplace flywheel, the, the virtuous cycle of uh, sellers competing, getting lower price to drive the uh, better customer experience with lower price. And this again is in the open uh, marketplace model. In closed marketplaces, you may not have that dynamic, but in some marketplaces, you may want that dynamic. Distributors sourcing from uh, manufacturers right onto the marketplace, or manufacturers, as we heard in the last session, selling directly in marketplaces. So essentially what you do here is you, of those eight activities uh, in that pipeline business, you outsource that to third parties, which enables much faster scale and the exponential uh, network effect of those connections between many sellers and many buyers is what helps the marketplace grow. So let's look at levels of marketplace sophistication or the evolution of marketplaces. So the marketplace maturity model, similar to the capability maturity model, CMM or CMMI, Starts with level one is the first party e-commerce, or it could also be standard uh, distribution or retail that's been around for, um, for centuries. So all those uh, eight activities we mentioned in the pipeline. Dropship is a minor incremental improvement over this. You outsource two of those activities, essentially the holding the goods and fulfilling the goods. You still have to set the price, you set, still merchandise it, you still have to um, uh, handle customer support and so forth. But level three is where you become a real platform uh, business model. The economics of that, that uh, virtuous cycle start really kicking into effect. And like CMN, CMMI, the quantitative management is when the numbers really drive the business. You automatically suspend sellers if their rating drops below three and a half stars. And you give them a 1% less commission charge if they're above a 4.8 stars. Uh, as 
you see uh, faster moving third party goods, maybe you want to bring those into your, uh, your first party carried inventory, or vice versa. If something's moving really slow in your carried inventory, uh, seasonal perhaps, or difficult to fulfill, you outsource that to third party sellers. Let the data drive the business. And optimizing is really where the, that defensive moat can be built around the business. So this is where maybe you're selling products, but you also add a marketplace for services. Uh, or you add digital goods, or you do uh, live streaming fulfillment, or you do uh, vendor promotions, you do more of the financial automation, so you can provide credit terms. We heard a few speakers about marketplaces discuss today. Lots of ways in which you can optimize your marketplace. So marketplaces will sell physical goods, sell digital goods as well, and sell uh, services. So you could buy a, a TV from a third party seller on Amazon, you could have somebody, a third party installer, come install that, th that TV for you from Amazon, and you can watch your uh, digital uh, movies from Amazon Prime as well. So combining multiple different uh, types of marketplaces into one. So let's look at the economics that are different between standard B2B distribution and uh, marketplace model. So it's essentially buy low, sell high. Your gross margin is the difference between what you buy it for and what you sell it for. Pretty simple. Marketplace is a little different. We heard the term commissions. So the seller sets the price. Again, I mentioned that's a differentiator. The seller sets the price. You as a marketplace operator, you take a commission, which can be in a grid, you know, from in B2B, it tends to be a lower commission, maybe 5, 10, 15 percent. Sometimes in retail, especially fashion, you can see 25 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent margins uh, in, in different categories. So you help others sell, take a slice of the pie instead of buy low, sell high. And you've heard the term GMV. Just to clarify what that is, that's a top line in, in e-commerce and retail and distribution. It's the same number, generally. Your revenue and your gross merchandise value are generally the same. But in the accounting for a marketplace, the GMV is the top line. So the price is set by the sellers at that, uh, what the customers pay. But your revenue in a marketplace is the, the actual gross margin that, that uh, you take. And it can come from other sources as well, which we'll talk about in a second here. So in this equation, this very simplified ROI equation, we have the fees, which can be many different types. Commission is one, you know, 10%, 15%, 5%. Um, or you can have a subscription fee. If you want to be a seller in a marketplace, you pay $29 a month or $49 a month to be a premium seller to get better rankings. You have list, listing fees, eBay charges that. You can have lead fees if you're not doing the transaction on your marketplace. The transaction happens off the marketplace. Lots of different types of fees. Advertising is becoming a huge opportunity for larger marketplaces. Have you heard some of the people here asking about um, manufacturers wanting to advertise on their marketplace? Amazon makes $31 billion a year from this uh, retail media network, essentially accepting advertising from sellers. Huge uh, opportunity. A lot of grocers are building out their own retail media networks, but it can also work in the, in the distribution model. And uh, many, uh, lots of different types of advertising opportunity there. Uh, constantly new ones popping up on Amazon, for example. And then other sources of, of revenue. It can be a fulfillment, like FBA or Walmart offers fulfillment services or 3PL type services. Um, lots of data is collected from a marketplace that can be sold or, or used as a leverage in building up tighter relationships with your suppliers, other types of lift. So the R return, the uh, revenue on the top, uh, goes up from many of these different uh, avenues from the marketplace. And at the bottom, some of those expenses, like the labor, goes down. You don't have as many people. You don't have to, if you want to double your catalog, you don't need to double the number of merchandisers. Uh, you don't need to double the size of your fulfillment center. So expenses go down, revenue goes up in the business model. And that's what makes it, you know, in traditional distribution or, or retail, if you double your, your, the catalog you want to carry, you may have to double your, your fulfillment center costs. You may need to double your merchandising team. You may need to double your uh, team that's going to be negotiating contracts with your suppliers. You may need to double the number of people entering, uh, entering data into the, the ERP. With uh, the network effect of marketplaces, it's more of an exponential, so your costs don't scale linearly. It's more of an exponential uh, ability to, to grow your, your catalog size, your revenue, your transaction volume with the marketplace without the increase in, in headcount or in capital expenditure for fulfillment centers. So let's look at specifically in the distribution model, uh, what are some of the, the traditional ways and how does it vary with the marketplace? So, and, and what does D to C work? In, uh, what, is the, what are the impacts of a D to C strategy for a manufacturer? 
So let's look at you know, what everybody knows is the traditional distribution business model that's been around for, for decades. So a manufacturer produces something for $1, let's say the example here, a distributor buys it for $2, and that transaction happens. So the, the manufacturer uh, makes a dollar of profit, and they get some data uh, about the distributor that they've sold to. Then the distributor you know, sells that $2 item, they, they purchase for $2 to the customer for $3. Uh, the goods exchange hands. The distributor gets money, money, profit, the dollar profit, and they get uh, information about the customer. But the manufacturer, the brand, gets no information about the customer. Right. So uh, that's a negative in the in the eyes of the manufacturer. A lot of manufacturers want to get that data about the customers what's going on with their product. So traditional challenge with the traditional model. Another approach taken is brands going direct to consumer. Now, what, what's the effect of this on their channel? Uh, so it starts out the same way, you know, they'll, they'll continue selling goods, manufacturing for $1, selling to the distributors for $2, they still get that, that revenue to the distributor. But then the customer, they're going to start selling to the customer for $3, they make more profit, and they get the customer data, but that distributor is left holding the bag, literally, shopping bag with the, with the goods. Uh, they're not selling it to the customers, they're not getting any customer data, so the distributor is going to stop buying from that manufacturer. Right. So obviously a, a channel conflict issue with, with this model. How can you solve this with a marketplace? So start with the same idea. The, the manufacturer sells it for a dollar to the distributor, uh, makes it for a dollar, sells it for two dollars, makes some profit. Uh, the distributor holds the good. Now what happens though is the customer goes in through a marketplace operated by the, the manufacturer. The manufacturer takes that order for three dollars they get the client data, the customer data, but the fulfillment happens from the distributor to the client. So an order is shipped over to the, to the uh, distributor, and then the goods are shipped to the customer. So the manufacturer gets data and profit, the distri distributor gets money and profit and customer data. Uh, so uh, the opportunity for everybody to be happier in this scenario. Uh, and that's one of the ways in which this, uh, the flywheel that we've heard so much about from Amazon and Jeff Bezos in this uh, simplified sketch. We have this, which I think people will get a copy of the, the yeah. presentation. Uh, if you want to have time to read through this in more detail, happy to talk about that with you. It also goes a little bit further down the stream into what, what a retailer can do with a brick and mortar uh, store with additional data in the marketplace model. But uh, I want to leave some room time for, for uh, questions, so I'll go, go forward a little bit more. So the third part of our presentation is is who runs a marketplace. So we're fortunate to have several of our uh, clients here, including Mike, who we just spoke about uh, based on. Thanks for having me here. Uh, but let's take a look at the big picture of marketplaces. We're gonna focus on B2B, but in a big context, there's also B2C, of course. There are companies like Amazon that sell B2C and B2B that cross that hybrid line. Uh, some, you know, Etsy and eBay were known for really the consumer to consumer business model. And you even have consumer to business like Fiverr, Upwork, uh, where <coughs> individuals can sell their services on a marketplace to a business. Or uh, YouTube, influencers get paid by businesses to promote products. And Shutterstock is a hybrid where you may have uh, getting images, selling uh, images on Shutterstock, but you may have individual photographers selling their images on Shutterstock. And an uh, interesting multi tier case is uh, in Latin America, AB InBev is kind of like that, that distributor, manufacturer, distributor customer model I showed. So on AB InBev site, the Anheuser-Busch uh, parent company, $50 billion distributor, uh, they take orders you know, under a different brand name called Z Delivery from consumers. Uh, again, this is the manufacturer going direct to consumer, but fulfillment happens through their network of uh, convenience stores and bars and other um, downstream organizations that will actually fulfill the order. So AB InBev gets the order, they get some profit, The downstream distributor or, or in this case fulfillment uh, retail uh, operation will do the fulfillment to the customer so the data the money changes and, and everybody's happy in that scenario can't do that in the u.s because of a, a three-tier regulations uh, about alcohol distribution so let's look at more of the retail uh, side now but you know, who runs a marketplace today in the biggest uh, global online retailers this is from uh, un data 10 out of 10 operate marketplaces. Alibaba being the biggest of over a trillion of GMV. Uh, in the US, 
nine out of 10 operate a marketplace. You know, the retailers, uh, with uh, Costco being the only one that doesn't, Amazon being the biggest with uh, now about a half a trillion of GMV. Uh, in Latin America, same thing, uh, nine out of 10 operate a marketplace. Uh, Mercado Libre is the dominant one in Latin America. Um, and then uh, it's not just the big guys though, it's some of the fastest growing startups. So unicorns are private companies valued over a billion dollars. And based on some CB data, uh, CB insights data, uh, eight out of 10, it's actually nine out of 10 now, Fanatics launched an NFT marketplace. Nine out of 10 of the fastest growing unicorns operate marketplaces. And some of these are uh, like fulfillment uh, marketplaces, Convoy, Flexport, uh, operate the distribution, uh, uh, transportation marketplaces. So biggest and some of the fastest growing companies operate marketplaces. Uh, basic line, we've already heard from Mark, Mike about his success, which uh, started from, uh, I guess, around 60,000 products and now is over 300,000 uh, products on, on track to, to grow that even further. Uh, and the great thing that, I'm not sure how much you highlighted this, Mike, but uh, uh, you really service the, the sourcing good person that wants to, uh, to purchase, you, you service the, the manufacturer, and you service the other distributors. Right. And it's well represented on your website that you serve the whole ecosystem um, it, it's not it's not just a one-sided business model like a lot of traditional distribution is. It's really leveraging the, the whole ecosystem. Another uh, one of our clients that's here today, uh, ChemDirect, another chemicals marketplace, uh, five trillion dollar industry. They have uh, four hundred thousand products on their marketplace. On uh, and this just launched recently, uh, is on on track to scale up to a million products in the chemicals industry. Uh, high high transaction volume. Again, selling different uh, uh, products to different uh, uh, in, to different uh, types of uh, business consumers, business customers, and, and again targeting both the manufacturers, the distributors, and the customers, the consumers of uh, the chemicals. Uh, Unify is one of our clients. They're, they're not here, but uh, this is a twenty-five billion dollar food distributor, the lo uh, largest or, uh, organic and uh, specialty food distributor in the, in the U.S. Uh, quickly scaled the marketplace up to a uh, quarter million SKUs, uh, and you know, have the ability to provide goods from different uh, service, uh, different uh, sources of goods. So, and this is a, a case where uh, their customers, sometimes grocers, sometimes uh, uh, bigger, perhaps a McCormick Place might order for them, for example, uh, they want to have access to small uh, suppliers of goods, and small suppliers want to have access to uh, the ability to sell to McCormick or other big you know, schools or prisons or uh, grocery stores. This is a great way for small uh, food producers to get onto these marketplaces and have that channel to sell to the bigger customers. Uh, so those are three uh, case studies. Uh, we talked about lots of others. We've built uh, dozens of B2B marketplaces. Uh, but now I think in the last uh, five minutes or so, we can open up to Q and A. You know, one of the more interesting things about uh, you know, we're kind of talking uh, kind of from the distribution perspective here, but I know a lot of, we haven't read about it yet, but I think we're going to. There's a very interesting federal lawsuit playing out in Chicago, uh, Chicago Federal Court here. It's the first antitrust case that's, uh, that's coming into play in the marketplace industry, if you will. And there's an independent uh, beverage marketplace that contends that the two biggest uh, distribution companies, one being uh, Southern Glazer, basically uh, is antitrust because they first began using, you know, the online marketplace, the, the you know the, the the pure competitor there, to learn all about how to market, how to how to run one of these things, you know, basically learn all the ins and outs of pricing data, and they in turn launched their own, but because they control such market share with you know, the restaurateurs and the bars and the hotelers, anybody else that, that sells uh, sells drinks for a living, that by their sheer volume, they were muscling their existing channel to use their marketplace at the expense of, you know, the original marketplace player. So there's a lot to come into play here with factoring in the upside for distributors and the downside. So kind of a fine line to walk in. It is. The, the interesting thing is the antitrust laws were based on protecting the consumer. Yeah. And the Amazon, a lot of people would argue that it's good for the consumer. The prices go down, there's competition between suppliers. Uh, it's not 
not so great for the third the third party sellers. It's a very rough space to be a third party seller on. Uh, who would have thought that Walmart would be the the friendly uh, source to sell your goods to nowadays compared to Amazon? So a lot of sellers are moving over to Walmart because Amazon is so rough. Well, it's funny. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a student of Granger, right? That's where we had uh, you know, DJ McPherson, the CEO. He's good. Uh, he runs. Right. Uh, right. He's an interesting guy because you heard him say he, he spends more and more time in technology. And that's strange, right? Thirteen billion and, and you know, uh, flagship for all this stuff. As a matter of fact, but, you know, he said, well, you know, we don't. Uh, he had he had an interesting dichotomy in his, in his in his notes yesterday. He said, well, we've looked at marketplaces, but not so much for us. And then three slides later, you're kind of looking at a marketplace model that Granger is doing, but just not calling it that. So, right. and then you know, Mark Mahaney, who was the guy after uh, the keynotes yesterday. You know, Mark wrote this eye-opening paper, uh, research paper, it got all around Wall Street and every place else on Amazon Business. He was the first one to kind of really extend Amazon Business G GMB against the 12 top competitors within the industrial supply space. And his takeaway was twofold, which is number one, Amazon by itself will drive 1% of all e-commerce sales relatively soon, and number two, inside a couple of years, just by the sheer volume of the SKU count that Amazon will have in place on, on uh, Amazon Business, will outdo anything Fastenal and Granger and MSC kind of even combined could do. So in other words, zero to 60, they would in turn become de facto the biggest industrial supplier, supplementing the, the, big, the big three, so to speak. That's interesting from I a mean, distribution perspective, which is friend or foe, you know, so. <laughs> It, I don't think the marketplace, I don't, I don't think that the free enterprise has weighed in just yet, do you think or no? Well, just to continue on the, the Amazon numbers, I showed uh, numbers for past uh, five year trajectory of from 1 billion to 25 billion in five years. Yeah. Uh, RBC forecast that to go, I think, by 25 or Yeah, that's the market behavior report I was talking about. Okay, to go up to 85 billion. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, it's going to be very hard for the 17% and the 10% growth rates that uh, Granger and uh, MSC are experiencing to get from the 5, 10, 15 billion up to 85 billion. You need that 2,400% growth that Amazon has seen in five years. Yeah, but you know, I mean, we covered this yesterday too. I mean, you get saw on the B2C side for years, which is, you know, there's always going to be a 900 pound gorilla of some sort within your industry. Right. In here, it's just happened to be called Amazon. But you know what? I mean, like I said yesterday, and it was proven true over 15 years of tracking niche web merchants in the B2C side. If you know your niche, like Mike does, and you know your customer base, like Mike does, and you know what these people want because you've serviced them for all these years, you know, just raise your game up to give them the same user experience they can have on any place else, including Amazon, because they won't have your inventory, your product expertise, or your level, your level of commitment to your customers so that's that's how you win, right? You know, and, and there's got to be a value add as well. Because yeah. going after broad line general merchandise like like an Amazon or Walmart uh, is a tough road to hoe. As I said yesterday in the, the session about uh, the distribution topic, you have to have a value add. You have to have something that's going to differentiate you. So you know, being the destination that's the the one source for all the fasteners. If you need that special uh, fastener that unique volume. Bay fasteners is where you're going to go. It's the only marketplace. You're not going to go to Amazon to try to look up 300,000 fasteners, right? That's not your. If you need to buy a, a truckload of uh, toxic chemical and uh, have it shipped to you, you're not going to do that on Amazon. Uh, these are unique niches. If you need the specialty food for your restaurant, you're going to go to UNFI. Those are all unique niches. Uh, I think as Alex said as well, the verticalization within a category, there's great opportunity for. Uh, B2B companies to, to dominate and offer that value added, perhaps being a, a machine or transportation equipment, construction site equipment, spare parts, as, a, as we, we discussed as well. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, uh, thanks to Tom here, thanks to Mike here. My takeaway for those of you who stuck around to because you're really, you, you're, really, you're really interested in this stuff, that's why you're here, get to know Tom. And get to know Mike. If you got questions about marketplaces, these are the ones to talk to as we kind of close out our show here today. But you know what? We're like Star Wars. We're an episode, blah, blah, blah. We'll be back next year to kind of tackle these same issues. So thanks for coming. You know. Thank you.